good afternoon. It's Wednesday. I'm here. Are you here? I know, silly question. You're watching. If you're here, you're here. How's your day going? I've just been sort of crazy around here. I had um, a surprise appointment at 7.30 this morning. How stupid is that? Who makes appointments at 7.30? I made it. But it was like, really? Really? Oh, I didn't love my life this morning. So that sort of threw me for the day. But now I'm here and I can't be thrown. I've got my coffee. And thanks to Michelle, I have chocolate. So thank you, Michelle. That was pretty exciting to open that package and see all the chocolate. I've been distributing it. Teacher Carolyn, there's some on your desk. I promise you, I didn't take it all for myself. So it is there. I promise. And Michelle, thank you. Because... We're enjoying that a lot, so pretty much fun. It's gonna be a great day today. We're talking care and handling. You know, it's the most important thing right now with flower availability getting harder and harder and with quality sometimes questionable and prices exploding across the board, we all need to do everything we possibly can to keep that quality up. Now, in the studio, we have a full house. It's kind of amazing. So you got me, Leanne, here. Hi, glad to have you. Then we've got Teacher Marisa and Teacher Michelle, both here, one on YouTube, one on Facebook. And we have Creative Parker, making sure that we stay online and everything's cool. Digitally, we have Caledonia on Facebook, Susie on YouTube, and Teacher Carolyn, she's joining us digitally, and I'm thinking David's out there. And then, for the first time in over a year, this is the absolute first time, we haven't done this because of COVID, but in the first time for the year, I think last August, I had a studio audience, which was kind of exciting. This time we have Mary Kay, Lara, Kelly, and Daniel, all from class today. Woohoo! <laughs> so, live studio audience, which really puts the pressure on. So before we start care and handling housekeeping, if you're on your phone, turn it sideways, it's bigger. If you're on your computer, go full screen. If you're on TV, I'm sorry because I'm larger than life. You're probably wondering why I put the sandbags up here. And actually, you're probably wondering why I sent you a video about sandbags. I can't believe that question has gone up like mad. If you got the Tulip Tuesday tip yesterday, you saw the tip about the best sandbag ever, and the questions start exploding on Facebook, on YouTube, on my personal email, on Messenger. I got all these questions. Why do you need sandbags? And I thought, okay, Kessler, poor communication. You didn't tell the whole story. I thought, of course I need a sandbag. Everybody in the world is like, why do you need sandbags? Okay. Sandbags are the best thing ever when you are weighting down large statement pieces or when you're delivering arrangements in your vehicle and you need to block them into place. We use sandbags for so many different things, but they're unsightly, they're ugly, they're like, Ugh, they're hard to carry around. And my husband came up with this brilliant idea many years ago where these are heavy duty waterproof purses. Yeah, really and truly, they're purses. And they have a little zipper, you know, and then he filled them with sand. And they make it easy to carry, easy to use. And when we were just filming the Wedding Floral Specialist course, and getting things ready to do statement pieces, it reminded me how important sandbags are. So like with the Harlow stands, if you're doing them outside where it's windy and it might tip over, take your sandbag, set it in, add a few greens around it, no one will ever see. So that's why you need a sandbag. And that's why Kessler needs to speak her words a little better because I left you in the lurch, wondering why in the world does that lady have sandbags? Well, now you know the whole story. So let's get started on Karen Handling. We've got lots and lots of fun. So if you have not introduced yourself yet, do so. Put your tulip if you're part of the, the people, the group here, and let us know where you're from. That way you can start collaborating and getting to know each other as well. Teacher Michelle, what's going on out there? 
Well, they're still checking in, but I wanted to give a shout out to Avery. She has done 26 corsages and 26 boutonnieres in the last two days, all by her lonesome. Avery, your fingers must be so stiff and sore, you must be going absolutely crazy. Congratulations. That's pretty great. Oh, I don't remember who it was. One of our students just um, had rot rotator cuff surgery, and so she's having to learn to work with her opposite hand. The dominant hand is now being injured, and I thought, brilliant, because now you can be ambidextrous when you do your floral design, so that's a good thing for a negative reason. Teacher Michelle, would you find me my dead hydrangea? I think I, I left it out there with you. I was trying not to rehydrate it for you. <laughs> so as we start Karen handling, we have um, lots of things that we're going to do, but I wanted to start with a technique that I find to be super helpful when things come in a little bit dehydrated. Now, unfortunately, this one came in in perfect condition, and so I've been trying to dehydrate it all day, and it wouldn't dehydrate, so I actually set it in the oven for two minutes, which is really, like, really, I can't believe I did that. You did that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't we did it. your flower card for doing that? Or something? <laughs> I was like, I can't believe I'm putting this poor flower in the oven. But now it's sad. And it's really sad and I wanted to start with that so that we have the whole hour to come back to. When you have a hydrangea that is incredibly sad like this, move my coffee, move my flowers. If you take boiling water, so teacher Marisa ran out and got me boiling water just before we went live, and just put a couple of inches in. You can see the steam. I hope you can see the steam because that proves that it's hot. Then if you take your hydrangea that's really sad because you put it in your oven, give it a cut nice and long. And I go both directions and I also kind of go up through the center. Then dip the head in water, get the head nice and wet. And then set it in the boiling water. And this one has a lot of foliage on it. Personally, I would take some of that off because it's going to try to rehydrate the foliage and you're more worried about the bloom. Now I'm gonna set that aside and we'll come back to that at the end of the hour. So, Teacher Marisa, Teacher Carolyn, students, help me remember so we don't forget to come back to that and see if it revived. Um, I've never put one in the oven before, so I don't really know if that's going to work, but I'm going to cross our fingers. Now another technique that uses boiling water. I'm going to do all the boiling water first so we get this done and we can move on. Two inches-ish. Okay. Dahlias do the best if you treat them with boiling water. You don't absolutely have to if you don't care how long they last. But if you want them to last a long time, you've got to treat them with boiling water. So you give it a cut and then just set it right in. Now these have actually already been treated. I will be honest, I can't lie to you. But it doesn't hurt to do it a second time and I wanted to be able to show you. So I did it like this, but they had been treated at the farm already. So I could have left them and they'd be totally fine. And people say, well, how do you know if it's been treated? Well, you know. Well, all you have to do is look at the stem and it looks kind of like cooked asparagus. And all of a sudden, you know, okay? Teacher Marisa, while I finish up with this, what's going on over in Facebook land? Well, do you want, okay, well this is a, quite a long question and I don't know if you're actually going to go over this product, but it's a Karen handling question. It's about petal proofer um, from Jen. So she bought some from the wholesaler um, to use for some fluffy pompous grass, okay. um, but she read that it prevents flower breakage. So how is this petal proofer typically used? Ah, great question. Jen, we'll go ahead and just jump into that. I wasn't planning on that one, but what the heck? Petal proofer, yeah, I don't really have one here. Petal proofer is primarily for chrysanthemums, like a spider mum, 
or a dahlia that has a lot of neat, you know, petals that go way out, so it's big fluffy flowers that could fall apart. Um, if you spray the back of the bloom, Petal Proofer is basically a glue, and that's all you're doing. You're putting a straight jacket on that flower so that it glues the black back together and it won't shatter or fall apart. So I use that on chrysanthemums and I use it on dahlias. You don't really use it on much else. It is just a spray like, um, here's one, thank you. So this is the Design Master Petal Proofer brand. There are other brands and if you can't find it, because with the supply chain disruption right now, the problem they're having is they can't get the dang nozzles. Can you believe it? That's what's making the paint be an issue. They can't get the nozzle because that has to come from who knows where on some slow boat. And so this is just sitting off on a shelf. It's sort of like, sell it to me, I have my own nozzle, but you can't do that. Um, but anyway, if you can't find Pedal Proofer, get the cheapest, heaviest, sturdiest hairspray you can find. Something like um, Aquanet, remember that from the 80s where you did your hair way up? And that works. So um, Petal Proofer is used to basically glue your petals together. Now the question is always, where does this information come from? Because a lot of what I'm going to share today is not what we teach you in class. In class we teach you the things that are tried and true and proven and in print much of what I'm going to do today is what I've just simply learned through experience. And in reality, much of what we do in the floral world is based on your very own experience because it will be affected by your flowers, your temperature, your humidity, your water. And so what I tell you might not work in your world. So I don't want you to take anything I say as gospel truth. I want you to take it as Hmm, that's something I'm going to experiment with and be a scientist. Find out if it works for you because that's the only way to know. There really isn't this super fancy science out there. Now, first off, if you took class from me 10 years ago, I taught you wrong because I used to teach you to use hot or warm water and now I teach you to use cold water. That science changed just two or three years ago. So the science is moving forward, but the old theory of using hot and warm water, and I also taught you that everything had to be cut underwater, remember that? Oh my gosh, we had such a mess of water all over the classroom all the time, but that was the way you were supposed to do it. And now that technology has changed and they don't advise to cut underwater. And that was the first thing I quit when I could because it's like, I is out of here. So if you did flower school 10 years ago, the world is different. Everything you do now needs to be colder water. And the only time you use the hot is like I just did for the hydrangea and the dahlia. The rest of it, I don't. So that's kind of your starting point there. And I'm going to set this just on the floor so I can trip over it until I figure out what else I need it for. Basic care and handling. Let's start that. And then I've got some different questions that people have sent in that I'll be addressing. And if you have a question, type it in. Teacher Michelle and Teacher Marisa will verbalize it so we all can hear. And I will try to answer it. And if I don't know, because I don't know it all, Someone else that's online with us, one of the other tulips, you may be able to answer. And if you're out there and you have a technique that you've learned that you think is fabulous, type it in there so I can learn it. Because I learn from you too. We all learn from each other. What else is going while I pull this together? Well, I would like to say hi to Charlene. She just started Advanced and she's joining us for life today. Hi, Charlene. Are you enjoying Advanced? That is so much fun. It is just it takes everything you learned as far as mechanics and elements and principles and theory, the nuts and bolts, and turns it to the art, the fun. Because then you know the nuts and bolts, so you can go on. So glad to have you. Teacher Marisa, what's going on? And then over here on Facebook, we have Janet, who is a new online student. Hi, Janet. Are you on the basic program then online? And before you, do you have the name of those? Because Donna says if those are pink, pink hammer, she's jealous. 
this is my pink hand. <laughs> oh! Oh, okay! <laughs> The name of the rose is, okay, of course now I have to prove that I can't see without my glasses, so now you know the truth about me. Um, oh, interesting, this is a new name for me, avant-garde, A-V-A-N-T-G-A-R-D-E, avant-garde. I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have guessed something else, I'm not gonna tell you what it is because I don't want you to think that that's it, but it's avant-garde, it's a great color, don't you think? Pretty cool. So, since somebody brought up my pink hammer, first question for you. Are you ready? I want to hear your answers. When do you use a hammer on your flowers? And bonus points if you know for what flower. When do you use a hammer? Okay. I want to know. Yeah, it's not a pink, <laughs> I love a pink <laughs> hammer rose. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, um, removing leaves and such, I like to use the rose cleaning glove. It doesn't hurt the flower, yet it protects my hand from the thorns. If you use a rose stripper, it can actually harm the flower. So please don't do that. Just use the glove. Um, it protects you. It protects the rose. It makes everything fabulous. So next week when we bring roses into the classroom, everybody will get out their glove and they'll all be getting their dozens ready and going on with dozens and half dozens and bud vases and hand ties and wedding bouquets and the whole to do -y. And they'll all have their glove out so that they can do this. So I'm not going to strip all of these. You don't need to watch me do that. But um, what else is going on? And I'll move to the next step. Okay, Leanne, well, we as a class have a tip today about roses that we play with today. We had some yellow roses that came in that had a lot of um, foliage leaves on them. And yesterday they came in, we just chopped and dropped them. We saw them today and they were super, super droopy. So what we did is we removed the majority of the leaves because I believe all the nutrients were going more towards the leaves instead of the flower. So we took up all the leaves today, we quick dipped them, and did they come back? They did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they came back. You know, there's a fine line there um, with removing the leaves and not removing the leaves because if you remove all of the leaves, it actually can slow the water intake because they help suck it up from the bottom. But if you leave lots of leaves, then it takes all the energy before it gets to the head of the flower. Sometimes, for example, the hydrangea, if it's already dehydrated, you're actually better to remove the leaves so that all the energy goes to the flower. So again, that's the experimentation that you've got to do to determine what's best for you. Marisa mentioned quick dip. Quick dip is a rapid hydrating solution. It's basically citric acid. It's non-toxic. So if you spill it in your coffee, it's not the end of the world. But it doesn't taste good, so you don't want to do that. But you give yourself some in a container. Many people try to save it because of the cost and the value. I discourage you from saving it. If you do save it 24 hours, 48 hours max, I tend to throw it away instantly. Because once it's contaminated, then it's not so good for the flower. So you really don't want that to happen. So when you're processing, removing some of the foliage, giving it a cut, dipping it, and then people say, oh, how long? Quick dip. The general rule of thumb is to kind of count to five. One, two, three, four, five, that type of thing. Sometimes I count to three. Sometimes I get sidetracked and I might do seven. Um, but they say count to five-ish, you know, and then you just drop it over. Shouldn't have leaves in the water. There we go. And then they should be great. Now, some flowers don't need quick dip. I find I do quick dip for all roses, all hydrangea, and all Gerbera daisies. 
I don't bother with quick dip for much else. Now, some people use it on absolutely everything, and it certainly is not wrong. I just haven't found it to be a necessity. That said, if my flowers got delayed, the box was waiting at, say, the FedEx office for four or five days because something went wrong, then I might quick dip everything to give it a little bit of help. But again, that's not science, that's experience. So you're going to want to experiment and just see what might work for you. What else is going on, Teacher Michelle? So Beverly had a question that ties right into what you're talking about. How do you open roses? Wait, no. <laughs> um, to open a rose, putting it in warmer water. You know, I told you cold water is best because that helps them to last a long time. Warmer water is good for them simply because it starts to warm up the whole drinking and the heads. Then you can also put them in a warmer location, not hot, but warmer location. And then if you're really desperate to get them really fast, as fast as possible, take a black garbage bag and put that over the top of everything. So you have warm water, flowers, garbage bag, you're making a greenhouse. And that steam helps it to open a little faster. Then if you go to our Tulip Tuesday tips, there's a playlist on YouTube. Susie put together all the tips into one playlist. There is a YouTube video on manually opening garden roses, but you could use it for anything. But you literally take your flower and after it's room temperature and after it's as close as you can get it doing all these things, you pour water onto the face. So you could hold it in the sink and let the water run onto it. And the gravity of water going in makes the petals go out and loosen and it helps it to open faster. You can blow on it. Um, another thing you can do is twist it in your hands like this. That can help. Um, but I found that that water technique down on the face gives it a little bit better than anything else. So. I have a question for you. Oh, well, not a question, actually. I have a couple answers about your pink hammer. <laughs> Do you want to hear the answer? I want to hear the answer, yes. Okay, well, so far, the few that we have, um, John says that they use the hammer when the flowers aren't doing what they want them to do. <laughs> Rick said um, when the bride calls for the 400th time. <laughs> Jen uses her hammer when a spider falls out of the bunch and scares her. But <laughs> we, had, we had a lot of people um, say using, um, uh, on like crushing the ends of stems, but Robin, Tilly, and Alana um, was more specific on hard branches, specifically lilacs. Okay. Well, I actually liked the first set of answers the best. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the correct answer, which is never, never, ever, ever. I know. I was taught, and I did day after day after day, take my hammer and a chrysanthemum stem. You got chrysanthemums in. You took that hammer and you beat them. Usually I was on my hands and knees on the floor, crushing those stems and beating them and destroying them. Then I also was taught to do that on heavy branches. Same thing there. And lilacs, same story. I was taught that as well. But the science and the reality is you're destroying the vascular structure. And so what you need to do is go to the hardware store, go shopping. Right now, I give you permission to go shop. Well, wait till after 4 o'clock. Hang with me now. But then, go to the hardware store. You want to buy yourself a big lopper. It's a heavy-duty pruner that's great big. You know, they've got the arms that are like that, as opposed to a little hand one. You want the super heavy-duty lopper, and that way you can get a good, clean cut, and your flowers will be so much happier, I promise. Now, if you took class from me 30 years ago, I still passed out hammers. We did hammer things because 30 years ago we did that. I taught different 30 years ago than I teach now. So if you're like me and just learning these newer things, don't feel bad. 
We all go, my gosh, I was doing that? I didn't know that. And now we go, ooh. Oh, wow. So thank you for being brave and answering that. I'm sorry I set you up to be wrong because that was probably a very rude thing to do. But I wanted to um, see if you guys thought the same thing I did, which was that you had to do that. Lysianthus. I started it while I was talking there. Lysianthus is a super, super, super thirsty flower. It's one that I take off almost every bit of foliage. I would leave a little bit up here, but I really don't need much. I just want to remove as much of the foliage as possible and then give it a fresh cut and get it into water so it will drink. Then, the thing that's fabulous about, ooh, I need to get my knife sharpened. The thing that is fabulous about Lysianthus is that it's going to continue to open. So for example, if I'm designing a way and I used this portion of the stem, okay, this is going to continue to open. Don't throw that away. Now of course this one has a bloom on it, but even this bud is going to continue to open you would be amazed at how they will open if you have removed that foliage and if you give it a good cut each of these buds are going to open now this itty bitty baby one here probably not that's not going to open but something like this definitely something like this probably but what's unique about it is as they open they won't be the same color they'll be a totally different color. So I stole these. These are actually going to go back into the classroom, so I'm not gonna do much with them, but I wanted to grab it. This particular variety, if we design with this bloom, which is this beautiful eggplant purple, and we keep these in water, they can be in the arrangement or they can be separated and put in, they're gonna open and they're going to be whitish green, kind of a minty color. But it's the same plant. It's just because if it's picked prematurely, it never gets the pigmentation that it does otherwise. So that'll be something that the students can kind of have fun playing with as they watch their blooms because they'll be totally different than the bloom that they started with. The pink isn't quite as dramatic, but that deep purple, oh my gosh, that is pretty dramatic. So back to my pink hammer. If you're not on our mailing list and you don't get our emails, you'll never know what the pink hammer is for. Because I just filmed the pink hammer and it really does have a use and it'll be coming out on a Tulip Tuesday tip. Parker, is it what, four weeks, five weeks? How, it's a ways out, is yeah. it? Maybe three or four. Three or four weeks? Okay, so it's coming. And so there is a reason that I have a pink hammer. And you'll have to make sure you're on the mailing list so that you get that Tulip Tuesday tip. And it's not to hammer flower stem. That is a promise. So I wanted to do another one that I get a lot of questions about, which is a gerbera. They often get comments from students in the online classes saying, well, my Gerbers are never as pretty as yours. They're just ugly. Why are yours so pretty? Mine aren't pretty. Yours can be just as pretty, but it's all in the handling. Now this time, I actually ended up with micro minis. In most classes, I use miniature Gerberas, but they um, didn't have enough pink in the miniature, so they sent me micro minis because I prefer micro and miniature to the full size, just because I feel like they fit in the designs better. But the micros are just fabulous. But you'll notice, you know, some of them, their stems are kind of crooked. They just have that little tip. And once it tips like that, it stays that way. So when you get your Gerberas, the first thing you need to do is take it out of the sleeve, give it a fresh cut, quick dip, because they like quick dip, and then suspend it. Ah, my grab is too, 
the uh, holes are too big for the micros. There we go. But send, suspend it in the top of a rack because what that's doing, the stem doesn't reach the bottom, so it's hanging freely. And if it hangs freely, gravity pulls it straight so that it's going to be nice and strong and turgid and you don't have that problem. And you, know, you can do them all at once, just kind of gently put their heads together, give it a cut, give it a dip, and then move it over to the Gerber rack, which I'm just going to drop them in here because I know they're too tight, but I'm going to set it aside and we'll take care of it later. Except that looks really bad. I can't see it coming. Leanne, where can you get those racks? Most wholesalers do have them. Um, if you can't find them at your wholesaler, check a, you know, do a Google search because they are out there and you'll come to a wholesaler that happens to have them. And that way you can easily do this. Now, if you don't have a rack, you don't have to have a rack. The main thing you have to have is a really tall bucket and then use a cookie drying rack. You know the little metal grid things that you put cookies and cake on? I don't bake so I don't have one but if I did bake I would have one and you would just set that across the tall bucket or a really tall vase and then just use that so you can do that. The other thing I do when we um, have a lot of production to do, our tables have um, some grid tops. We have some like rolling, you know, you've seen those rolling rack table things. They have a grid top and we can just put the buckets on the bottom shelf and put the Gerbers through the grid rack. So you may have something like that too. So just think creatively. You don't have to have exactly what I tell you to use. You can use different things. So now this is a technique for Sherry. Sherry has sent me a question. So tip, Sherry, I hope you're with us. This one's for you. Okay. Sherry asked me, how do you deal with lilies when you want the look of the pollen nodule? Because in class, we teach you to remove the pollen nodules. You see the little nodules there. And we say remove that because it's going to damage the petals, and it will. But a nodule is kind of pretty, especially when you see the white lilies with the really dark nodules. They can be exquisite for that long. And then they pollinate and they get gross and they ruin the flower and it's awful. And she wanted to know if I had any tips for being able to use those and not have to pick them off because in wedding work, she likes it. Well, that could be, but wedding work is also the most volatile because can you imagine getting pollen all over a bridal gown? Not a good thing. But I learned this from a florist in Bend, no, Prineville, Oregon. Prineville, Oregon. So it's kind of over by Bend. It's on the east side of the mountain. And she was a florist long, long, long ago. And I learned this from her in probably oh, late 70s, early 80s, somewhere in there. But if you take clear nail polish, you can actually, and my nail polish is so old it's falling apart, there we go. You can actually paint the nodules and it will never pollinate. It will never stain your bloom. Now, are you gonna do this for every arrangement that goes out of your store? No, don't even think about it. You do not have time. That's when you pluck those little nodules off. But if you had a bride that really wanted that look of a beautiful white lily with the dark nodules on it, that's how you do it. So it's time consuming. Now she actually did it for everything in her store. She was adamant that flowers were supposed to keep all their parts and she wouldn't take it out. And I was doing a workshop and she was just like, well, this is how you do it. And I'm like, that lady's crazy. But you know what? She was right. If you had a specific use, she was crazy good. So that was brilliant. So clear nail polish. Teacher Marisa. Well, Sherry says thank you. Oh, good, you're here. Yeah. yeah. 
And then John has been finding that when he's been getting his lilies in, the uh, bottoms of the stems are like shriveled. Is there, are they dehydrated or should he cut above? Definitely cut above. They're dehydrated and once a lily stem starts to shrivel, you're kind of screwed. So you've got to go above it, quick dip it, and pray. Um, because it, once it reaches that shrivel stage, sometimes the vascular structure is so damaged that it doesn't work well. I gotta have a cup of coffee, guys. You know, this is stressful having everybody in the studio, so give me just a minute. Well, while you're sipping on your coffee... I'm uh, sucking it down, I'm not <laughs> sipping. While you're sucking down your coffee, thinking about your pink hammer, um, <laughs> Um, so it, um, as far as the Gerber Daisy Wrap, um, if no one has one or doesn't have like the, the cookie thing that you were talking about, um, Donna uses chicken wire that she just puts over the bucket. Brilliant. Good job, Donna. Yeah, that and would then, work. And then Scott has actually used foil over it and poked holes with chopsticks and put the Gerbers through the holes. That would work for the micro minis. Oh, Scott, thank you. I love that idea. You know, you all are the best. I never thought about foil, but that'd be perfect because it would just mold over. Good job. I like that idea. Oh my gosh. So Donna, Scott, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Freesia. I stole these from the classroom too, but I'll give them back, I promise. You're just stealing all my flowers today, aren't you? <laughs> and I've even been baking them. Um, when freesia come in, sometimes they're damaged. This one just has one petal that's torn. So I would just take that one petal off and totally leave the rest. But the biggest thing about freesia, I don't think that's still even a little too much. They're like ranunculas and anemones. They actually prefer shallow water. So using just a couple inches of water for the freesia, I've had much better luck with that. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but I've had a lot better luck. The other thing that I have found, like that's a bad petal, so plucking that, that's a dead bloom right here. That guy, he's spent. If you leave that, this bloom is just going to stay right where it's at. It's not going to do anything else. If I remove that, clear back to the stem, remove every bit of it, these other buds are going to open. And it gives me great joy to take even like a little sprig like this. This would be the type of thing that I would take off and then put just in a little tiny vase of water and watch it open. And if I really nurture it and keep it with fresh water, it will open. Now, it's never going to do this. But I feel like Mother Nature, it just makes me happy. And so key is, if you have a spent bloom like that, get rid of them. Anything that's spent. Now, there's a group of people that say you should never cut the freesia at all. You should just put it in water. I don't, I can't do that. I have to put it in water and cut it. I, I don't know. I have not done that. Parker, what do you have there? Well, I was just going to, uh, Mia asked a good question real quick. Are you, is this all flower food in the water at this point while you're processing? Ooh, good question. Good job, Mia. Um, yes, I have flower food in everything already. I should have said that. So some things I quick dipped in front of you. Everything I prepared with flower food already in the water because I, I'm a firm believer in flower food for everything. It really does make a difference. So um, definitely, now this one, that's a stem. That's not a bud, get rid of it. It's just gonna mess you up. This one, sad, get rid of it. This leaf, let it open, let it be happy and give it that little bit of shallow water. Shallow water is for freesia, ranunculus, and anemones. Those are the, oh, and callas. Callas like shallow water too. And when it's down this low, oftentimes I break it off because I figure it's going to break in the vase or bucket anyway. But again, save those and let them be your little science experiment that you just makes you happy and makes you smile because that's what's fun. What else is going on out there? Well, I have a first timer on YouTube. Raylene is joining us for her very first live. 
Hi, Raylene. Welcome to live. Everybody say hi to Raylene. Get to know her. Make her feel welcome because it's kind of weird to be a first timer when everybody knows each other already and you all are having your little conversations out there in digital universe land and the new person is going, how do they know each other? Well, they know each other just because they come every week and they get to know each other. And we encourage you to collaborate with each other. And I know that some of you are sitting there having a glass of wine, bragging about that, I'm jealous. And some of you are eating dinner and telling us what you're eating and we're all jealous. And some of you are still at work. And some of you, if Tess is with us, it's like 1 a.m. So she's actually curled up in bed watching me while she's in bed because as soon as I get done she goes to sleep so I don't know where you are but that's how we all get to know each other is just by showing up and making sure and saying hi and then interacting so another flower question that I got this one was from Doug okay. and Doug wanted to know kale how do you keep it alive a little longer and how do you keep it from stinking? Because it does, it's just stinky, stinky. Key is remove any of the oldest damaged leaves like so. Sometimes you feel like you're taking everything off, but get rid of the worst, okay? Then, now maybe use the taller base for this guy. Tess is in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tess. <laughs> you know, it is fun because when you're from all over the world, you don't match my three o'clock in the afternoon just before happy hour, you know? Um, so I've got my flower food in here. That is done. And I found that with kale, if you use the correct mix of flower food, it helps because it keeps that bacteria down. If you underfeed or overfeed, it can create a problem. So you've got to really follow the measurements that are on there. But then, old school, we don't teach this anymore at all because you're not supposed to do this anymore. But guess what? Old school, if you take a little splash of bleach, and I do this for kale, and I do this for baby's breath, gypsophilia, not much else. We used to always do it, but just a little splash. And you know, if you did food service ever, you know a couple tablespoons of bleach in the water is what you use to wash down things all the time. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's not gonna kill them. It's not gonna kill your flowers, but it can definitely help the kale from getting ickier. Now guys, when we dump all this water out, we have to remember Leanne put bleach in the kale vase so that we don't get it all over our black jackets. Um, right so that's the negative. <laughs> yeah. But it does make a difference. Now, a couple other things here. Let me grab some more. Leanne, real quick, let me shout out Christy who just signed up for flower school. Christy? Yep. Yay, Christy, I'm glad you're joining us for Flower School. You're going to love it. Get to know everybody online here so that you can intermingle with them. And I'm going to hand this way over here because I'm going to knock it over. And I'm going to make a mess. I've kind of backed myself into a corner here. Let's take a look at our hydrangea. Ha-ha, <laughs> look at this, guys. Even cooked, it came back. And it's, I still have 15 minutes to spare. So we'll let it go a little longer and watch it. But... The question is always how to take care of hydrangeas and what's the best. Hydrangeas, quick dip is a really, really, really valuable thing. I take the plastic off because that can be um, causing more mold, botrytis, mildew. You don't want that on there. And then when you put them in the bucket, don't put them so close together that they're smooshed. You gotta give them breathing room, which I know we all never have enough buckets, and so then we put things too close together, and that's really a negative. But if you open it out, let it breathe, make a decision about how much foliage you want to leave on it, give it a cut, good. and then dip, okay, and then place it in a vase and let it drink. I do the same thing with miniature hydrangeas, 
Now, many times they'll come in with these little plastic sleeves on them. You can see I left that on so that you could see that. Take that off. You know, you don't want that. Give it a fresh cut. Dip it. Place it. Removing the sleeves. Okay. And then let them drink. Now, Quick Dip is what I use for care and handling. And when I'm designing, I use alum. And I know the class today was asking the teachers, you know, can you use both of them? And you could, but you use them at different times. So alum is a little white powder. It's a pickling spice. So what I would do is hydrate the hydrangea with the quick dip, okay? Leave that to sit a minimum of two hours. I prefer overnight if possible. The longer they sit, the happier they're going to be. Then once you go to design and you're going to cut this down, you're gonna give it a cut to put in your arrangement. At that point, dip it into the alum and then do your designing. So then you would actually be doing both the quick dip and the alum, but not at the same time. So quick dip is for processing, alum is for designing. So that can actually help you, again, keeping your flowers live a little bit longer. Move some things around here. Leather fern, the thing we love to hate. It's back, coming back in style. It's funny. It was when I started, every single arrangement we ever made had leather fern in it, period, because that was the foliage we could get. And in all my years of teaching students all around the world, the only two items that have consistently been available in any country, any time of the year, is leather fern and roses. Everything else has either non-existence or shortages or that doesn't exist, but I've never had a student tell me they couldn't get leather fern, and I never had a student tell me they couldn't get a rose. So it is sort of like the necessary evil. Now full circle ahead, so it was in style because that's what we had, then nobody wanted to use it because it was overused and that was all you used, so then it was like, Ugh. Ferns are back in style again because it goes in cycles. Just like baby's breath. We always used it, we always used it. Nobody used it, it's really ugly. No, everybody is using it again. So the trick is how do you make it last the best? And for that, I have a big black bucket that you can't really see. And I filled it with Pixie Sparkle, um, which I didn't bring in with me. But Pixie Sparkle is a white, milky substance. I'm going to try to turn this so that you can sort of see it. Can you see it, Parker? Does it show on camera? Yeah, you can see it. Oh, good. OK. Well, I don't want to dump it all over my table. <laughs> but it's a white, milky substance, um, Pixie Sparkle. It was actually, I believe, I'm telling you this off the top of my head, and I might be making up, but I think it is true. It was um, a product that was invented by two brothers in Texas. And then it was distributed by various people. And now getting distribution is proving to be hard. And so some people haven't been able to find it. So we don't teach a lot with it anymore. But Pixie Sparkle is the best thing in the whole entire world for foliages. If you can't find it at your wholesale house, because I'm understanding that many are not, Google it. I did that myself today and it does exist. So you can find it on the internet. And it's this white milky substance. It has the recipe on the bottle. What I do is I fill my bucket with cold water, not warm, cold water. And then I do a glug. I know that's very scientific. A glug of pixie sparkle. And then I mix it. And then what you do is you just take your fern and I shake off the cooties and you just put it in. Now, especially like with plumosus and asparagus fern, tree fern, leather fern, all of those, it makes them last and last and last. I mean, literally, it will triple the life, maybe quadruple. If you have troubles with sword fern, 
That's a very short-lived fern. If you dip it in the pixie sparkle, it doesn't die. It holds wonderfully. If you don't dip it, it dies very quickly. So I go through and I dip it, and then I let it sort of dry, and then I find for ferns of any type, rather than storing it in a bucket, store it in a plastic bag, or in like a Rubbermaid tote, anything that you can seal and make airtight, it will last far better than it does if you put it in a bucket. But the key is that pixie sparkle, which teacher Marisa and me said, don't dump that out when you're done, we need that. So I'm not gonna dump it out so that the class has it to use. So we've got that, so, okay. Other questions and thoughts out there? I have a lot. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you get 10 minutes worth. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna shoot out just two and then we'll go over to Michelle. Well, oh geez, okay. Well, <laughs> Well, I want to get them all out because they're really, really good. So back to the bleach. Janine actually uses Clorox crystals to avoid the splash. And let's What see. is that? I've never heard of that. They're like little, I think just like little droplets, little crystals instead of just the liquid. So, yeah. Whoa, so that's a new thing? <laughs> oh my gosh, so Clorox crystals. And it just dissolves in water then. Oh, I like this idea. And then really? Scott wants to know about possibly vodka in the water, or is that just to sneak a little drink when in the walk-in? I don't want to share my vodka with my flowers, except, except with my potted paper whites. Because if you water your potted paper whites with vodka, it stunts their growth and they don't go all over like that, like a tipsy person. Instead, they stand straight for longer. So that's the only thing I would even consider sharing my vodka with, would be my potted paper whites. But I don't do it on a cut paper white because they don't, it doesn't benefit them. So again, more to me. Um, but yeah, vodka would do the same thing probably. Yeah. And then lastly, I had a couple people ask about um, when opening roses and putting uh, water in them, does that uh, contribute to causing botrytis? Yes, it does. It does, it does, it does. So do not, I should have said that, thank you for bringing that up. If you dump water in your flower, then you're getting water on the inside, which is going to build botrytis. So you only do that at the last. So when I would do it, it would be for a wedding or an event where I'm doing it, I'm opening them, and I'm delivering it and not putting it back in the flower cooler. Because at room temperature, out in the air, it'll be totally fine. Enclosed in the flower cooler where it's high humidity, it is going to mold in there and get botrytis and not be a happy flower at all. So don't do that. Thank you for asking that. Other thoughts, questions? So Elaine wondered if you had a tip for keeping coxcomb happy. Coxcomb has never given me fits, so it could be um, how dehydrated it is when you get it. If I was doing coxcomb, I would cut it, dip it, place it in water with flower food, and it would be just stunning and fabulous. If that's not working for you, take off more of the foliage maybe, see if that helps. And then worst case, coxcomb is beautiful dried. It keeps its color, it'd be no issues whatsoever. So take it and just hang it upside down so that the stem stays straight and strong and then use it dried. I think it'd be totally fine. One other comment that I would like to share with uh, everyone out there in regards to hydrangea, because actually a couple people had, um, had commented saying that they tried the quick dip and their hydrangeas didn't come back. And we have played with this a bunch in the class. If they take, remove off the bigger leaves on the top and make sure to cut above the knuckle. Okay, so removing some of the foliage so that it's not sucking that out from the flower and then cutting above the knuckle. And the, the science that goes with that is they, whoever they are, have proven that if you have an air pocket in a stem, it never goes up more than two inches. Now, 
Is there a roadblock there? I don't know. But it stops at that two inch point. So if you're going above a knuckle, chances are you're going above that two inch point. And so you're removing off any previous air pocket. So that solves that. Dendrobiums real quick, and then I'll go more questions. When we get dendrobiums in, you can see this one's a little sad. This one's happier. Immediately remove those tubes. The tubes don't hold enough water and it constricts the stem so that the vessels can't expose as they get hydrated. They just, they, they get really tight in there. Then dip it for a little bit. I sometimes actually soak it, but oftentimes I just dip it. I wouldn't soak it for a very long time because if you soak it for a very long time, um, they get sort of translucent. The water uh, affects the face of the bloom. But if you dip them so that they get wet, then give them a cut, and then place them in water, they'll rehydrate better. In the classroom, we cut them And see, see the stems are removed, they've been cut and placed in, but we leave the plastic bag on to keep the moisture around them. And that helps them to last better than if they're just out in the air. So that's, uh, that's a big benefit there. Other questions? Vol just wants to remind you, don't forget the hydrangea. Oh, let's check that out again. Find out how our hydrangea is doing. See? And I grabbed some status, too, because I thought that was an old school thing that I think we all forget about. Oh my gosh, our hydrangea is so happy. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. So I can now tell you, if you let a hydrangea sit out for four hours, because I took it out when I got here, well, three hours, and if you put it in the oven for two minutes, that you can still revive it. Pretty amazing. I use temperature of 200 degrees just in case you need to know. I know. I, I'm going to go home and David's going to go, you did what? What were you I drank this for dinner. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Victoria has been having this argument in her shop about hydrangeas. Okay, Victoria, what's your argument? Can hydrangeas go in floral, floral foam or only water? They do totally fine in foam if two things. One, they're fully turgid and hydrated. They have to be happy when you start. And two, I always use alum when I work in the foam. I find that most important in the vase. Sometimes I skip the alum, but in foam I always use the alum and I never start unless they're fully turgid and hydrated. Okay. Old school status in the days when we had roses, carnations, leather fern, and status. And status was like the coolest thing ever because that was the new item. That was what we had just started getting in. And it was sort of the cool follow to baby's breath, which we were all tired of. If you take and remove the side leaves, just like so, and this is one of the few items that I actually take my knife and I peel, like you're peeling a carrot, peel that down because if you've ever had status get stinky, it's those wings, it's that that gets stinky. So if you remove that, it won't be stinky and it won't do that. Now, it takes more time, so you have to make a decision. Are you going to get rid of it before it's going to get stinky or do you have to? Teacher Michelle, Teacher Marisa, you're down to your last minute. What do we need to know? Well, just something to share when I went over fair and handling with the class earlier this week. One of the things I use on status is a potato peeler. That would work perfect. A potato peeler, because while I'm doing is peeling it. Excellent idea. I have never, I personally have not done that. Um, Tulip Tip Tuesday. There you go. <laughs> I'm thinking that's a Tulip Tip Tuesday. No, you heard that. <laughs> I know. Get that down in notes so we don't forget. Oh my gosh. How grand is that? Okay. Any last questions? No? Any questions from you guys from the class? No? Nothing. Okay. okay. 
So I think I got the questions that you guys had emailed me in, and I think I got the questions that you asked here. We'll watch through the comments, and if you think of something else, type it in. We'll try to catch that and answer for you. You can always email us here, leanne at floraldesigninstitute.com, and we will answer. You can always call us, 503-223-8089, because we are here to help. Hopefully, one of these days, You'll join us in class, be it online or in person, and you'll get the whole Karen Handling story and not just the old wives' tales that I've learned as I've grown along with this all, because really today I was sharing Leanne's Karen Handling, things that I've just done over the years. This isn't what I actually teach in the classroom because I have no proof other than what I've tried. So now I invite you to experiment and try explore as you find new things new ideas new ways share it back with all of us so that we can all learn from you because you know if we don't do it together we aren't going to succeed it really takes all of us so thanks so much for joining me today it's been a ball i had so much fun i enjoyed my coffee hope you enjoyed your beverage of choice and i will see you next week i don't remember what we're doing i'm sure it's fabulous oh i think it's something is it the aifd testing next mm -hmm. week ah some of you are testing for aifd in october and some of you are testing in july so next week we're going to do tips and techniques and advice for preparing to test because we train you on all the design we train you on getting ready but sometimes it's those little tiny tweakings that can make all the difference in the world so uh, if you know somebody who's testing let them know that's going to be next week and i'll see you all at three o'clock have a great evening and see you next week bye bye